after an enriched conversation this afternoon um, in the World War Community Book Show. It is a great honor to present Dr. Silvio Torres Ayan in this symposium tonight dedicated to the poet uh, Pedro Mir. Uh, Torres Ayan and Don Pedro have many things in common. Not only do they share nationality and research interests, moreover, they share being exiled. As Torres Ayan has expressed himself, when we think in the condition of the Dominican diaspora, those who emigrate do so because they cannot stay. Our immigration is the same as expatriation. Torres Ayan es una referencia obligatoria en los estudios dominicanos. Habría que hablar de un antes y un después. Con la forma en que Torres Ayán abordó temas considerados incluso tabú en la comunidad dominicana, como el tema racial, el pensar del ser dominicano desde su posición de esposa. Con Torres Ayán, las personas que hemos, nos hemos embarcado en estudios dominicanos, hemos encontrado un apoyo también como no solamente como el profesor, como todos lo, lo, lo llamamos, sino también como un eh, guía y también support, soporte para nuestro trabajo. Es decir, que a la hora de nosotros estudiar la experiencia dominicana en los Estados Unidos, tendríamos que referirnos a, a él. Eh, como dice su biografía, eh, él comenzó eh, su trabajo en Hostos Community College cuando estuvo aquí en la ciudad de Nueva York, eh, fundó, eh, fue uno de los cofundadores del Instituto Dominicano, de Estudios Dominicanos en City College de Nueva York. Y yo podría detenerme por hora en mencionar los títulos que ha publicado, pero no lo voy a hacer porque todos tenemos esa información en la biografía porque lo hemos leído. Eh, pero sí voy a mencionar algunos títulos como el liderazgo intelectual, eh, también el intelectual history of the Caribbean, eh, introduction to Dominican blackness, Caribbean politics, el retorno de las cholas de Dominican Americans, entre otros títulos. Lo, lo que yo pienso es que espacios como estos, alternativos, son cada vez más necesarios. Y quiero agradecer al profesor Torres Ayán el estar aquí con nosotros en Nueva York esta noche. Y sin más, quiero invitarlo a que comparta. Quiero eh, agradecer las palabras generosas de la colega Sara Cordiel y también unirme a ellas en el, en el razonamiento sobre la importancia de espacios alternativos como este. Eh, Terminando específicamente a Nueva, refiriéndome más específicamente a Nueva, por la acción que yo no había. Uh, 
because the forces uh, that are against the kind of efforts that we are committed to are very large and very strong. Um, I see. Uh, I see. We are doing work that I like to call um, brow bending. Uh, by which I mean the subverting the binary between low brow and high brow cultural projects. Yeah, and that is extremely important because. When communities have more or, le or less access to particular cultural production, yeah. usually people think of distance as if distance were physical only. But there's such a thing as psychological uh, distance and, 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 and cultural distance and social distance. The sense that you that such a place you, you don't belong there even though it's next door. Yeah. So um, I remember. When I first, uh, I had to go to Brooklyn College uh, to know that in my art history class that there was a place in my neighborhood called the Cloisters. <laughs> and not only that there was a place there, that, that that place was there, but because I was assigned a project to the Cloisters, uh, it became a place that it was clear that was mine too. Yeah? But that took an empowerment of, a, of an art history class, yeah, where I could see, you know, and then after that, you know, it opened my, my, my sense of, of uh, access, psychologically. Now access is wherever, wherever something is not called private, yeah, whether or not they want me there. <laughs> you know? um, so there's that, and um, also, um, uh, in awe of the, and, and, and I much admire, the cross-cultural and cross-lingual intent of this project. Because yeah? we, we always had Dominican activities in the, in the Heights, Dominican libraries and so forth, but to aim for a cross-over, a cross-over community, is to uh, empower ourselves with greater possibilities for making a difference. Because we know that uh, you know the forces, um, the forces, for instance, that are interested in, in, in removing certain populations from mm -hmm. neighborhoods such as Washington Heights, yeah, they're very powerful, and they do not really care so much what your ancestry is. You may lose your, your apartment, uh, you know, whether you come from originally from Eastern Europe or from. Uh, the Dominican Republic or, or Haiti, yeah. Um, and we know that we are at a time, and it's, it was, it's very socially savage. The last time I heard something that uh, made me shrink, after that I, I became immune, was when I heard the mayor of the city of New York, before the present one, who said, if you can't live in New York City, if you can't afford to live in New York City, you better go somewhere else. Yeah, that's the mayor. So that means uh, that is a, an invitation to the hounds, developers, go after them, and you'll have my support. Yeah? And we have some incidents even in the community uh, involving legislators uh, of Dominican descent. Yeah? But I'll, I'll just say this. Um, much uh, in the previous part of today's program was said about Pedro um, I had a very scholarly presentation um, which I'll share only a, bit, a little bit of, of, of with you, because um, just simply to give you a couple of uh, items that, that we need for the remainder of my of my words, but I'll try to stick to the to the numbers uh, to the minutes that uh, Daniela gave me, even though she said that she doesn't know how, how long I, I'll speak. You know, as if I didn't know that she called me that. <coughs> You're the boss. <laughs> <laughs> so. How much do I have? Ten, do I have twenty more minutes? Of course, you're the keynote speaker. All right. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that, but that doesn't mean I'm entitled to abusing my audience. <laughs> um, so, um, who's Pedro Mim? You, you've heard much about him um, today. Those of you who joined us for the earlier parts of the program, a poet, fiction writer, aesthetician. He's uh, he has written many books on aesthetics, 
what constitutes art, beauty, and, and all of that. Uh, it, also, it is also making some important claims uh, about taking, taking issue with claims that major uh, philosophers have made. Um, he, he, he published his first poems in 1937 through the agency of Juan Bosch, the Dominican politician, uh, who had already achieved distinction in Dominican letters. Uh, that was before he had, he had to go into exile, Juan Bosch. And no other poet over the past 120 years has been the object of as unchallenged a consensus of respect and admiration as Benoit. Yeah. When in 1982, legislators from the across the ideological spectrum um, and the various political parties in the American National Congress decided to declare me the poet laureate of the land, they were they were responding. Uh, <laughs> this. So way making this a bit higher, or maybe making me shorter. <laughs> <laughs> no? Okay, so I just uh, forgot that it is. I just make it a bit more. Oh, beautiful. Oh, nice. Thank you. Beautiful. Yes, they can. In fact, sure. Um, so, um, so when they when they did that, they agreed across difference uh, to uh, to name Neil uh, uh, poet laureate. They were responding to his credibility as an artist and a citizen known for his integrity, even if they did not espouse it. It's important to remember that sometimes people who hate you politically admire your seriousness uh, of your principles. Yeah. Um, Equally worthy of note, no other poet in the land since the year 2000, the year of his death, seems to have earned enough support from the various factions to replace him in that honorific post, uh, which has uh, remained vacant over nearly two decades. I remember my slightly senior colleague, Fran Moyacones, the distinguished historian of the Dominican Republic, during uh, sharing with me vivid memories of first going to a public meeting when he was a, a young man in Santo Domingo at a workers' center and musing about how the poet uh, soared to Olympian heights as he recited his verses. And we heard that recital, the, 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 the dramatics, yeah? the theatrics of his. Uh, and it, it's clear that, that, that his dramatics, his theatrics had, it, had an impact, had a bizarre effect on his audiences. It was kind of a, the, the closest we've had to a rock star uh, in, 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 in literature. And, and whenever that happens, it is never a poet. It's usually somebody who is a fiction writer who has sold, uh, you, know, um, you know, I imagine amount of numbers of copies, yeah? Um, so he, uh, in, in the 90s, then received the, uh, the, uh, the National Prize, uh, the National Prize for Literature the country's highest distinction for literary artists. Um, our school editions uh, uh, at the time, at the time when, when the Baker Service Institute emerged, we zeroed on him as a person whose, uh, whose name we needed to contribute to, uh, to, to sort of uh, disseminating in the, in the larger literary world. And um, we, we, we held events. Uh, it was all the things that, uh, that uh, Saida said today that reminded me of um, Ilka, Ilka Tania Bayan, uh, mm -hmm. the great uh, you know, Dominican performer, uh, actress. When we held an event at the uh, Palace, United Palace Theater in 1993, uh, she, she appeared uh, reciting uh, Ayn Paisa del Mundo. And uh, that was a very memorable, I don't know if any of you remember uh, being there. It was a very special moment, and um, Emil was present was uh, seeing it, yeah, which was uh, which was remarkable. Um, and and uh, Roberto Marquez referred uh, earlier today, and so did David uh, Cortez Caban, uh, referred to the fact that I was also in the college in 1992, three was it? 
to Bali. Uh, we held a long day event at, at the federal group, uh, which brought, uh, basically brought us together, Roberto, David, uh, and the other scholars. Um, so, um, he began writing poetry as a, in the 1930s uh, as, a, as a high school student. Uh, but only when he, um, when he actually sent poems to the press, to this uh, column that uh, Juan Bosch was editing, did his poetry take like a, a definitive turn. He says that at first he wrote about everything uh, that, that, that he wrote about uh, Greek goddesses and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. It was only when uh, when Juan Bosch returned his poems and said, uh, "You you show tremendous talent here, but maybe you should be writing something closer to your reality." And he took that, uh, you know, and that seems to have been a bit of so much a piece of advice from an editor uh, who first uh, at first acknowledged the this talent and then said, "Maybe you should be using it." In a, in a more judicious manner, yeah? Um, so, I first discovered Pedro Mir myself, and the reason why I then, as the uh, founding director of the Dominican Studies Institute, sort of put a, a major event together and having Mir featured as the main figure, yeah? Uh, so, so I already had, had met, I had discovered Mir. I first discovered Pedro Mir through Aide Vital. Uh, I know a Puerto Rican professor in the English, in the, I'm sorry, in the Spanish and Portuguese department of New York University, where I was enrolled in the comparative literature PhD program. I have not, not, not yet discovered the, the Caribbean Northern Dominican Republic at the time. So when I came, when, when I spent my first years uh, in school uh, in my native country, the city of, the city of Santiago, uh, to be cultured, ser culto, yeah? Did not mean knowing, knowing, knowing your stuff. It meant knowing the works of the writers of the cultures that really matter. Yeah? That means you know, all of Spain, antiquity, and, and, and all of that. Uh, which, I, which I'm still very interested in. But that uh, as something that allows no room for knowing the Caribbean. <laughs> so um, I discovered uh, Pedro Mir. Um, when I enrolled in a in a class taught by her then, um, the year must have been 1992, since the comparative literature department allowed uh, me to take some courses in other departments, I gravitated to an Italian Italian course, lured by the intrigue I felt over the title of a course, over a course entitled Caribbean Literature which uh, focuses on writings of Cuba. So if you go to the Spanish program, you expect Garcia Lorca, you know? Uh, it is Latin America, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, right? Uh, the big, the big uh, writers from the, from the large countries of Latin America that have great metropolises as, as capital, like Buenos Aires, Mexico's Bay Jefe, and you know, and, you know o -O Bogota, Colombia, um, and Santiago, Chile, but some Dominican Republic. You know, no, that doesn't change. I said, oh my God, so let me, let me see what this person is doing here. So then I learned for the first time that the Caribbean as a cultural area. Um, uh, a cultural area that merited scholarly consideration on, on its own right, rather than simply as extensions of the so called motherlands or the countries involved, or, or as poor relations of the more commanding nations of the hemisphere, such as uh, the United States, Canada, Argentina. Uh, Chile, Mexico, and Brazil. We read the works of Nicolás Guillén, Luis Rafael Sánchez, Ana Lilia Vega, Lilia Cabrera. To introduce me, Vitali gave us the selections of, of Dominican, of, 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 Dominican of, of Pedro Luis verse uh, that uh, was much, much spoke, uh, spoken about today, the Jaime La Bastida uh, collection. Um, which, uh, which may have been the, what served as a source for Walsh and Cohen's translation, right? Is that correct, more or less? Correct. Yeah. Um, so there, um, one of the things that Vitaly did that was uh, important for me was that she chose to, uh, along with the, with the poems that we were reading,
reading from that super small uh, book, Selected Poems of Neil, uh, by Mexican poet and editor Jaime La Bastida. She also brought in uh, a long play that uh, this was a recording, a sound recordings of, 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 that, of the poems in that collection um, with Neil's voice. And that, and, um, and so I began to, uh, to think of, then she did something even better. Um, not only did we hear, did we hear Neil's uh, voice telling us the poems, reciting the poems, but then we got to a poem called Al Portaviones in Terpi. Uh, to the uh, to the to the uh, air, airplane to the aircraft car aircraft carrier in Trent, which is now something that we in New York are familiar with, right? We have it as a museum uh, <clears throat> on, the, on the Hudson, yeah. But it just so happens that that uh, machine was in the vicinity of. Of Santo Domingo in 1962. Um, I remember being captivated by Neil's delivery of his lines and by the emotional intensity uh, exuded by every word he pronounced with power and precision. In the text, uh, the, the, the speaker is addressing this machine, the Intrepid, <clears throat> uh, which is an impressive uh, air and ocean war machine that now sits at the same museum on Hudson, Hudson River, uh, where it listens the speaker's uh, reproachful words addressed to the awesome, awesome machine. <clears throat> Involves the event surrounding the chapter known as the Cuban Missile Crisis, the time when the United States prepared for war with the Soviet Union in connection with the Soviet-made missiles that have been identified as being in Cuba and ready for, for use in the Cuban national territory. Yeah? Uh, I might say, well, Cuba has the right to have stopped in its territory, but we have. That was not the geopolitical situation in which uh, that could be a sound claim. So, the, um, in the end, um, as the United States prepared for war, and, and those of us who are, maybe not me, but I know writers who have, who have captured this, actually seeing the ships moving towards one another from the Soviet side and from the US side. And it was clear that this was going to be the end of the world. Uh, many people, uh, well, many of the, uh, the shelters that we still have in schools, right, they from that period when kids would do drills, and they would, they, they would learn what to do when the mushrooms began to fall, and so on and so forth. Yeah. Uh, Julia Alvarez has a beautiful, has a beautiful uh, poem on, on that, when she says that she imagined the, uh, the mushrooms to be uh, snow-like. Uh, it's beautiful. Now, but what, what, what Vitali also did was, she asked us, to notice what was happening to the pronunciation of words in the text. She urged us to listen closely to the recording with an ear on Neil's Castilian pronunciation of the C sound and the Z sound, both of which speakers of Spanish raised in the, in, in, in the Dominican uh, Republic pronounced in a, in a way that is indistinguishable, indistinguishable from the S sound as a, <clears throat> as a hissing C civil sound. Vitali invited us to notice um, what she heard, which was that Mir begins to, uh, uh, at first, at the, as the point begins in the reading, Mir seems religiously committed to preserving the castillianness of his pronunciation. <clears throat> but as he proceeds and the poem uh, kind of high, halfway into the poem, uh, uh, 
in keeping with the emotional crescendo staged by the words as the patriotic fervor intensifies in the speaker's condemnation of the invasive presence of the mighty USS Intrepid, which the speaker says uh, came to the placid Bay of Santo Domingo simply out of fear. <clears throat> um, fear of the Dominican people's hunger for justice, thirst for freedom and willingness to die, to put an end to the to tyranny, the mere uh, sort of schooling in Castilian pronunciation begins to falter. Um, and so the, the idea that, uh, that speaking like a Spanish meant to speak correctly. Yeah. And, then he, and then his pronunciation begins to give way to the Creole sounds of the Dominican, of the Dominican masses as we pronounce the C and the Z. And we're no longer saying uh, hacer, and we're no longer saying corazón. We say hacer, corazón, son. We say, uh, right, whether it's S, Z, or C. <coughs> Now, I don't know if you, if, if, you, if you see much here, but I was, I am enormously grateful uh, to Vitali, uh, to Adele Vitali for instigating what, for me, uh, I understood, I digested as, 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 a, as a downright revelation, one that gave me courage to think about the quandaries of Caribbean populations which have had to contend with regimes of schooling invested in, <clears throat> in, um, in the promotion of cultural parity. Yeah? Uh, basically copying off the countries that matter. Copying in terms of ways of being, ways of inhabiting the world, as well as uh, ways of appearing or sounding. I'm happy to report that today, as far as I know, no self-respecting Dominican, Dominican teacher will inculcate in the mind of the young the ill-guided notion that sounding like you've just landed from the Iberian Peninsula is the way to, uh, to achieve correctness. Uh, I myself confer, uh, confess that is to becoming a bit cocky when it comes to affirming uh, what I've, the culture that I have gotten from my people. Um, when I see so, especially when I see someone uh, dissing or stigmatizing Dominican or Caribbean cultural uh, forms uh, or expression. I mean, I don't have a problem with, with anybody stigmatizing Dominican individuals who deserve it. And, uh, and I, I know that there are tons of them uh, who, who, who could use some stigmatizing and dissing and, and dismissing. But when I encounter recriminations of folk culture, which usually come as the product of some unnamed and often difficult to trace, that was beginning difficult to trace, a collective unconscious, I put on my fighting gears and close. One example comes, comes in handy here. Uh, who, uh, there was this uh, former co-worker who once, in her anthropological wisdom, uh, noted that Dominicans, she said, she discovered, yeah, so slow, slow, yes, yes, um, <coughs> The, um, yeah, that's the problem. Yeah, it's like, in order for me to, to get the signals, I have to be watching. But if I'm not watching, it's a problem. It's like me. I can put on my agenda that I need to do that, but if I don't look at my, my agenda, uh, you know, I end up not making me. Right? So, um, so uh, this former co worker tells me uh, something she has, she has noticed in her anthropological wisdom. That is that. Uh, us Dominicans, that we Dominicans, uh, use many archaisms. And I go, what do you mean? Uh, give me some examples. And also, so, so she gave me a list of terms, uh, which, are, which are terms that Spain, or at least the regions of Spain that she is familiar with, no longer use them. Uh, and now, since I recognize those words as part of ordinary Dominican uh, speech, I quickly retorted with the rhetorical question, how can these be archaisms if we use them every day? You, you're supposed to be laughing now. <laughs> you know, what, what, is, what is archaic? That you know some, somewhere in the remote past. 
So if, if Dominicans are using it every day today, how much of a, re a remote past can that possibly be? Yeah. So basically, uh, what, what I realized, what I understood was that she wanted for the Peninsula to control the clock and words. Yeah? And so since they gave up on those words, maybe uh, 100 years, 50 years, 150 years ago, that Dominicans should not be using it. But you can't do that. Yeah? And so I then became um, interested in, and to some extent, uh, going back to the initial to that initial, um, to that initial experience with the recording of Pedro Mir's um, Al Portamiones in Trepido, I, I became connected to it with Mir's Caribbean vision. Uh, the, Caribbean, the vision of the Caribbean, I mean, you recall that those lines that were uh, cited, uh, Yo, un hijo del Caribe, de uh, una humilde criatura boliviana y un obrero cubano, Precisamente Antillano, you, you recall, right? Uh, basically, we have here a poet who is, of uh, the Dominican Republic, who is unique in locating himself civilizationally in the Caribbean. Yeah? There is a former minister of culture, not too long ago, yeah? who, was, who, who actually answered. Uh, a question from a, a young scholar who asked, uh, asked him about uh, his connection with uh, literary production in the rest of the Caribbean region. And he says, I have nothing to do with this. What do I have to do with the black Jamaica, for instance? Mm -hmm. or, or, or somebody from, from this or that or that or that land, right? The fact is that the Dominican Republic, which is the center of Caribbean culture, is also the most Caribbean denying of the country's hemisphere. Um, Mir uh, has a, a view of the poet as a, as, as a, as a person who, who has the power, the virtue, and the gift, perhaps the good luck, of speaking for the men. He says uh, he actually believes that there's such a thing as, uh, as a collective voice that a, an individual poet speaks, and that. He even explains in, in quite uh, figurative terms. He said, when everybody, when all the people speak together, uh, their voices uh, uh, cause noise, all, all those voices speaking at once. So the, 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 the people actually speak when their concerns can be gathered into the voice of one artist who, speak, who, who genuinely speaks for them. Yeah? And so he becomes, he becomes like Ben through which they see. He thought, he, he thought that. Yeah. Um, he also thought that the poet is on the side of justice. What the, the people, the, the poet who be, uh, whom he respects, yeah, is on the side of justice. That is why you know, he's always uh, thinking of, uh, of the poet as this person that will alert us about, about changes in history that will move us towards uh, some greater inclusion, some greater uh, you know, humanity. Um, just like, you know, uh, like a, a, a poetic ethos uh, could be like a theology. Just like you have in, uh, in Martin Luther King. Right? Martin Luther King is, uh, is very explicit. He says in the sentence, the universe is on the side of justice. That's a, that's a you know, straightforward uh, line from, uh, from King. If you're going to fight for good, you have to believe that there are some allies. And if you think that the universe is not alive, that's not so bad as you, yeah? Um, how am I doing? Uh, more or less? Yeah. She's kind of, she's kind of uh, considered. <laughs> um, and always, uh, and always a, uh, a, a poet um, speaking for this inheritance. What, what I like to do uh, to, uh, to his, uh, um, Daniela's concerns uh, about. Uh, I, I'm going to I'm going to make a claim here. In 1971, Pedro Mir received an appointment uh, to be part of a Instituto de Cultura, 
which had just been founded. 1971 is uh, the first year of the second term of the, of the repressive and corrupt government of Joaquin Balaguer. And, uh, and he was invited, he was, uh, no, not invited, he was appointed, and he found out in the press. And he wrote a letter in which he said, and if I may be permitted to read it in Spanish, to read some portions of it in Spanish. Um, for instance, no ha sido, first of all, señor Joaquín Balaguer, not excelentísimo señor presidente de la república, señor, no tanto por eso, señor. Joaquín Balaguer, presidente de la república. No ha sido sin sorpresa que he visto por la prensa que usted me ha distinguido con una designación de miembro activo del Instituto de Cultura recién creado. No me es indiferente la valoración por más que es inmerecida que tal vez la presentación implica. Desde luego, me apresuro a expresarle mi reconocimiento. Pero creo que es mi deber también expresar mis reservas públicamente, lo cual se había podido evitar con una discusión previa del asunto. Es decir, si usted me hubiera, si usted me hubiera dicho que me iba a nombrar, ¿verdad? antes de que saliera en público, que yo estaba nombrado. ¿Quién se cree usted que es? ¿Ya? Um, es indudable que la creación de un instituto que se traduce, you know, such an institute could, could be a good thing, and so forth. Ahora bien, a mí se me habló de un proyecto, eh, se me habló de este proyecto de una manera tentativa y por, y por vía telefónica, a través de amigos, a quienes tengo respeto. Pero, pero no, eso no era suficiente, había que ver cuáles eran los lineamientos, la acción que se llevó. Eh, por esta razón, constituye para mí una sorpresa verme designado sin que antes quedara en claro en qué medida, bajo cuáles aspectos, sobre la base de qué premisas, mi colaboración sería útil y mi participación apreciada. Luego, varios párrafos más abajo, eh, habla de que esto, esto requiere un programa, una visión, una, visión, una, una filosofía, qué es lo que se quiere lograr. Entonces dice, pero también no es necesario acceder aquí a muchas personas de indudable capacidad y pureza ideológica, sea cual sea su posición, que participan también en este programa de trabajo. Pero también es notorio, porque la lista apareció, there was a list of the members. Pero también es notorio que fuerzas retrógradas de nuestro país, elementos responsables por la conservación de las tradiciones más negativas, no solo públicas, sino también intelectuales de todo tipo, constituyen en el seno de esa formidable institución una fuerza insuperable y enérgica. En otra palabra, eso está lleno de trujillistas, ¿verdad? Defensor de, de, de la vacanza y de, de asesinato y cuantas cosas. ¿no? Además, de, y, y dotada además de recursos imperiosos y de actitudes cívicas, que nada tienen que ver con los ideales de regeneración y de materialización de una patria más hermosa, más ejemplar y encaminada en la dirección más firme del progreso. En el siglo XIX, 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 con las más expresivas gracias por la presión que usted se tiene a prestar a la presente carta, queda usted muy respetuosamente Pedro Díaz. Entonces quería comparar esta carta con una que vio. Lo, lo, con esto lo que quiero ilustrar es que esta postura de mí, el, el escritor que había, que, que, que había podido ganar mucho, ¿verdad? Con el favor del gobierno, con el favor de, de este caudillo que manejaba el presupuesto nacional como si, eh, como si fuera suyo y lo, se lo sacara de, 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 de los bolsillos, ¿no? Eh, él tenía mucho que ganar, excepto su dignidad. Entonces, para demostrar que no es un caso excepcional, sino que aunque son los pocos, no son los únicos, me regreso un poquito atrás a una señora que se llama Carmen Natalia Martínez y Bonilla, una poeta importantísima. 
Eh, y aquí hago notar que tengo acceso a este documento gracias a la documentación, a, a la compilación que hicieron Ginetta Candelario, Elizabeth Manley y, este, y, y, y Janice Bain, Janice Bain de 100 años, 100 años de feminismo dominicano. Un, un trabajo de, enteramente de documentación. O sea que ahora uno puede ir y buscar lo que estaban pensando las mujeres a distintos niveles sociales. Sobre todo, sí, sobre todo el base de la crítica, porque tampoco vamos a, a engañar. Dice, escribe el presidente, febrero 28 de 1947, ciudad Trujillo. Tenía que hacer que ese es el nombre del parque de la ciudad. ¿Verdad? El señor Rafael L. Trujillo, señor Rafael L. Trujillo N. Yo no sé si ustedes saben lo creativo que es esa forma de llamar al presidente. ¿Ya? Y lo subversivo que es. Reducirlo a su condición civil. ¿Ya? Porque aunque él era un gran dictador, él se hacía pasar por elecciones a cada rato, cada cuatro años. Entonces él estaba jugando el papel constitucional, lo cual lo convierte en un ciudadano. Entonces vamos a tratarlo de tal, aunque él, él, él iba, iba, iba a dar rabia. ¿sí? Pero que quería que llamara, que llamara querido jefe. O la, o la, o la forma más larga. ¿no? Señor, Señor presidente, me permito exponer a usted lo siguiente. Mi hermano José Antonio Martínez Bonilla fue destituido del empleo que durante más de dos años desempeñó en la Lotería Nacional, con, eh, paréntesis, empresa privada habiéndose efectuado este despido sin el preaviso ni el auxilio de cesantía que indican la ley. ¿Ya? Y cuando pone, y cuando pone, eh, y cuando pone eh, en paréntesis eh, empresa privada, es para dejar claro que el gobierno, aquí la diferencia entre su espacio privado o público. ¿Sí? Mi hermana Carmen Julia Martínez Bonilla, fue separada del cargo de maestra del Colegio Santa Teresa, paréntesis, escuela privada, por presión bajo amenaza del inspector Félix E. Valero. Mi hermano Andrés Martínez Bonilla fue expulsado del Colegio La Calle, escuela particular, es decir, privada, por presión de un alto funcionario de su gobierno, es decir, de educación, empleo, ¿verdad? Mi padre, Andrés Martínez Aybar, fue despedido de la compañía dominicana de teléfonos Sephora, empresa privada, donde rindió servicios por más de 15 años por presión del señor R. Paino Pichardo, secretario de Estado de la Presidencia. ¿Quién suscribe? Yo. ¿Ah? Fue despedida del empleo que durante 10 años desempeñó en el circuito Rialto. Empresa privada, donde por presión igualmente del señor R. Paino Pichardo, secretario de Estado de la Presidencia. El hecho de que toda una familia haya sido despojada de la única forma de sustento que posee su trabajo por persistente acción coactiva de aquellos que se arrojan los medios para lograr sus propósitos, no tendría acaso tan definido carácter de atropello si la coacción no hubiera culminado con una última medida de fuerza. No bastó con eso. En el caso que el señor José El Múdesi, propietario de la casa en que vivimos desde hace 14 años, a Avenida Calle Arzobispo Noel, número 33, y cuyo alquiler pagamos mes por mes, nos fue avisado personalmente que nos notificará el desalojo de la casa. Pese a la absurda y ridícula, ridícula excusa de que cita, necesita hacer reparaciones en su propiedad, cita. la verdad es que el señor El Múdesi actúa de esta forma por presión, por presión que ejercita sobre él directamente el señor Virilio Álvarez Piña, presidente de la Junta Central Directiva del Partido Dominicano, 
de repartir oficial de judío. Llevar las cosas a ese extremo, no puedo sino entender que nuestra familia constituye un estorbo para su gobierno. No podemos sino entender, ya que, ya que son altos funcionarios de su gobierno y su partido quienes de manera sistemática ejercen las medidas coactivas, siendo así invalidadas, ¿no? siendo así invalidados de ejercer libremente el juicio, el justo derecho de trabajar honestamente y de vivir dentro de una casa a lo que aspiran todas las personas en cualquier región del globo por incivilizada e inculta que esa región sea, comprendemos que la única solución posible está en abandonar nuestro país en procura de ese medio de subsistencia a que toda persona tiene derecho en todas partes del mundo. Con esta misma fecha, hemos dirigido solicitud de pasaportes para todos los miembros de nuestra familia, amparándonos, amparándonos en el artículo 10 de nuestra Constitución que consagra la libertad de tránsito. Esperamos que dichos pasaportes nos sean concedidos a la mayor brevedad posible. Derecho que demanda respetuosamente una familia sin otro patrimonio que su dignidad y sin otro ideal que vivir dentro de los principios que esa dignidad establece. Respetuosamente, Carmen Natalia Martínez Bonilla. Um, and then uh, a footnote added by the Puerto Rican publication that made this, uh, this letter public after she sent it to the to the Generalissimo, the uh, letters, uh, the, the footnote says, um, los pasaportes no han sido concedidos. El señor, el doctor Martínez Bonilla, su padre, está preso, y la señorita C.N. Martínez y su hermana, Asila. Yeah? I give you something, something of a sense of what it means to, uh, to live in a, in a, uh, uh, in a dictatorship, of that kind, in the shamelessness, is the, is the, is the, is the ultimate principle. Now, there is, uh, Bellamy wrote, wrote a, um, um, this very important point on the death, the, the murder by the Trujillo regime of Las Hermanas Mirabal in Amelia Maripo, right? And um, she, but she wrote hers. Um, I, I, I didn't copy, but it was also uh, it was during while Gigi was still in in, in power. Yeah, she wrote a poem. Uh, I'll, I'll just read the first and then the, the last stanza at the same time. I wanted to to end with a note on Inés Paya. No, no blancura, no blancura igual a tu blancura. Dice, hola heroica a las hermanas Mirabal. With Trujillo still in power. No blancura igual a tu blancura. Nardo a su cena alivio, más no le de su carne. Sorry, no tu blancura, sino su blancura. Confíate. Nardo a su cena alivio, más no le de su carne. Carne hecha para el beso, fue pasto de las balas. Las Mirabal cayeron bajo el plomo cobarde. Lo cual es importante porque el gobierno dio a creer que, a, que, la, que la muerte, que el asesinato había sido un accidente automovilístico. Y entonces ella está llamando aquí bajo el plomo cobarde. No hubo dulzura igual a, tu, a su dulzura. Los ríos se crecieron para llorar por ellas. Palomas sobre el pecho florecido en claveles. Las mirabal cayeron de, de cara a las estrellas. Ayudadme a subirlas al pedestal de tierra donde graba la historia de los nombres de sus mártires. Y aquí vale solamente la primera última. De dejar todo el seguir, yo no le gusto. Las dos son las cosas. Mas ya el nardo no es nardo, pues que se ha vuelto piedra. Piedra le mies tu puño, piedra la frente alta, piedra el pecho, los ojos y la boca sin lengua. Las mirabal cayeron para alzarse en estatuas, y sus bocas sin lengua, han de seguir hablando y sus tres corazones palpitando en la piedra, perennemente vivas en el alma del pueblo, las mirabal cayeron para volverse eternas. Entonces, pensando en 
en, en, en clases de poetas, poetas que reconocen que son parte de una sociedad, que aparte de ser artistas también son, son ciudadanos y ciudadanas, ¿verdad? Y que, y que debe importar lo que pasa a sus conciudadanos y conciudadanas. La gran poeta dominico-americana llamada Fina P. Espaillat eh, fue de las primeras que cuando, cuando el, gobierno, el actual gobierno dominicano decidió copiar la práctica, la estrategia del, del Fair Price y hacer, y, y, este, y hacer una ley que, des, que le retiraba la ciudadanía a los dominicanos de, una cierta, de un cierto origen étnico, ¿ya? tal como le pasó a los judíos, a los alemanes de origen judío, y que luego le, 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 le pasaría a los, a los ugandeses de origen asiático, ¿ya? que también en los 70 pues, hicieron esta condición, eh, quedaron este, depatriados de la música alemana. Rina Espaillat eh, fue personalmente a la oficina del de embajador, de los, eh, embajador dominicano en los Estados Unidos, entonces se me olvida el nombre, el que era director de, fundador de la revista Rumbo, eh, fue y llevó una carta de protesta, haciéndole saber que ni ella ni ningún, o ninguna, ninguna persona dominicana que respetara su condición dominicana, que respetara la dominicanidad, iba a aceptar que la dominicanidad se lo estuviese utilizando para cometer barbaridades como esas, en contra de otras. Eh, esa carta pues, eh, hizo, hizo algunas noticias, sobre todo en los medios que, en los medios que estaban dispuestos a cubrirla, especialmente en, acento, en, en la revista digital AC, no en las otras, en otros medios, ¿no? donde también hay una correlación entre entre el apoyo de la prensa al régimen y otras y, y, y la, la, la prensa puede facilitar la presión entonces Rina la invitaron en el 2012 uh, la, la organización de Dominican American National Round Table invited her to, uh, just, to, just to be honored and so on so and distinguished and she accepted then she brought uh, a, uh, a message that she wanted to, uh, to leave behind uh, to the Uh, to the audience uh, that I honored her, she decided to write a poem, which is called Nací en la Ciudad Primada. Uh, it's, uh, it's in the form of coplas. Uh, coplas is a Spanish, traditional Spanish form that has a bunch of repetitions in the, in the sound, the sounds. And uh, uh, La Ciudad Primada, primada is, is recognizable because um, Santo Domingo is the first, what is it? The first European city in the new world. And, and that Dominicans translate as La Ciudad Primada de América. Yeah? So she says, in, in the poems that she read on occasion, she, she said, Coplas, nací en la, la ciudad primada. Nací en la, en la ciudad primada donde nació el continente. De todos los ríos del mundo fluye el agua de mi fuente. Crecí en Quisqueya la suave y en el, en el valle del Cibao, en la sombra del caemito, la lechosa y el cacao. En el patio de mi casa, en el amor de mis viejos, aprendí canto y costumbre, cuentos y cultos perfectos. Sorry, cuentos y cultos añejos. La marchanta y su batea, el, el dulcero y su pregón, el cafecito en la tarde, la Virgen y la oración. En mi sangre corre España, la costa de oro y el pi, taíno, negro y negrero, los tres se juntan en mí. Con el más recién llegado, árabe, chino o judío, porque el que pisa mi tierra, renace, <coughs> por el que pisa mi tierra, renace hecho hermano mío. Aprendí luego el exilio que impone la tiranía, por eso vivo tan lejos de la tierra que fue mía, Sé lo que dictan los años, lo que enseñan las distancias. No deja de ser humano quien cambie de circunstancias. Aunque lo nieguen y aunque lo niegue quien quiera, somos hermanos de cuna. Nos parió la misma tierra y toda la tierra es una. Esa es mi España. 
eh, utilizo ese poema para decir primero que Rina es payar, es su. Ella es poeta americana, American American poet, because as a, as a child she had to uh, she had to settle in the United States. She was part of a she was part of a, 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 a diplomatic family, and the family got in trouble with the dictatorship of Cujillo because the, the elder in the family wrote a letter back to uh, from Washington D.C. wrote a letter back to the, the Dominican government expressing his discontent over the news that he has heard. In the South, was a very bad way of promoting the Dominican Republic. That uh, it, well, as, as far as you can see, what he read in the news had to do with the Dominican government being involved in massive murder. That of course sufficed. They became persona non, persona non grata, and, uh, and, then they, and then became exiled. Uh, and then, so she knows what it is to be. So she is a U.S. She is American because her Dominicanness was interrupted by dictatorship. Yeah. And what I like to say is that if Pedro Mi were here today, mm -hmm. have been here in 2013, September 2013, would this be? with this new law came about, he would be saying the same thing, and he would be opposing uh, this horrific act of shamelessness on the part of people who are not interested in Dominicanness. If they were interested in Dominicanness, they would not pull on it in this manner, mm -hmm. by actually making, making Dominicanness uh, uh, synonymous with the oppression and abuse of disempowerment of others. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.